you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in this matter is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing. Thank you. Detective, you anticipated my question. If you're willing and able to safely and responsibly testify without a mask, please do so. Thank you. Attorney Brown. Good afternoon. Please state and spell your name for the jury. It's Brent Baverstock, B-R-E-N-T-B-A-V-E-R-S-T-O-C-K. What do you do for a living, sir? I'm a detective with the Dane County Sheriff's Office. Uh, in your role as a detective with the Dane County Sheriff's Office, were you asked to follow up in the investigation of two missing people, Bart Halderson and Christopher Halderson, in the early part of July of 2021? Yes. Uh, initially, what was your role in the investigation? Uh, I was not initially a part of the uh, first response to it. However, um, maybe shortly before noon on July 8th, uh, Detective Liz Allen came to my office. Uh, she said she had uh, just had a phone call uh, with the mother of Catherine Mellander, who was the girlfriend of Chandler Halderson. Um, and during that phone call, um, she didn't, intended to do initially just a, a phone interview, just, just kind of get some background information, but some things on that phone call alerted her to believe that we needed to follow up with a uh, in-person interview. Uh, so she came to my office and asked me to, to sit in on that interview because we try to interview people, you know, with at least two detectives there to support each other. Sure. And uh, was that with uh, Dulce? That was with Dulce, correct. And um, just briefly, if you could describe Dulce's kind of a emotional state during some of that interview. Um, well, we got to the location where we agreed to interview her, um, which is she was in the middle of some classes, uh, trying to improve her education. Um, and we sat in a, a side little conference room, and she was emotionally distraught. Um, she kind of had this look of fear and panic in her eyes. Okay. Um, now, they've testified, so we're not going to talk much about that interview. Um, but at some point, do you end up uh, going to a farm that you thought uh, might have been visited by Chandler Halderson over the 4th of July weekend and leading into the next week? Yeah, based upon our interviews with them, um, uh, we determined we needed to get out to that farm right away and search it. Sure. Um, I think it's been described as being near Cottage Grove, but kind of in a rural area of Dane County. That sound fair to you? Yes. The entire location of that farm, is that here in Dane County, Wisconsin? Yes, it is. Okay. And it, fairly remote? Yeah. Uh, had you ever been there before? No. Um, if you could describe the farm just in general to us. Sure. Um, uh, well, it's uh, probably 30 to 40 acres. Uh, a lot of it is wooded. Uh, the house sits in a wooded area. Um, there's a um, paved driveway that goes up from the road um, that kind of turns off to where the house is. And then if you kept going straight on that, it would turn into a gravel and then up into the grassy area would be where like the, the back shed was in the pool and the raspberries. Did you personally yourself walk out there with uh, Crass or Dulce or anybody? Yes, I did. Who was with you? Um, well, I had first gone there, um, responded out there pretty quickly. Um, there were a lot of red flags that popped up during my interview uh, with, with Crescent, and um, I called to the command post uh, to Detective Sims, and I talked to her, and I'm like, I need some more people. We need to get out here. We need to search this place right away. Um, but we were pretty stretched thin at that point. We had sent a team up to, uh, a team was uh, headed up to the cabin to uh, do some more investigation up there. I'm like, we need some more people. Um, we need to get out there and search it. Uh, so uh, she was able to uh, provide at least another detective, Detective Tim Blank, along with me and uh, Detective Liz Allen. And then while I was on the way, I contacted uh, Barry Ehrman from the Dane County Medical Examiner's Office and asked him to respond with his cadaver dog to help us do the search. Sure. Um, I got there and nobody was there. I had expected uh, Cress and Dulce to meet me, to beat me there. I went to the house, knocked on the door, and nobody answered. And I got worried that they may went up and started searching on their own. So I went up there. Um, I went up into the grassy area. I can see you have a photo of uh, the farm there. Um, so I could see whether or not anybody was back by there. And, uh, you know, I noticed, you know, during my contact with uh, Crest, she did talk that she had recently seen vultures uh, circling over the property. Your Honor, I'm going to object as hearsay. Sure. 
sustained. Did you yourself at some point see some birds uh, over the woods? Yes. And what were those birds? Uh, turkey vultures. And did that raise red flags to you? Oh, yeah. Why? Um, you know, most birds really don't have a sense of smell except for turkey vultures. Um, turkey vultures actually... We have to squeeze in a break. We'll get you right back into the courtroom for more of the detective's testimony next. Welcome back. Let's go straight back into the courtroom for more of the detective's testimonies, talking about the things he noticed that were odd with respect to Chandler Halderson. He said, well, it looks like cars driven through the tall grass over here. I'm like, yeah, it does. So we went over there and uh, we saw there were two tracks of the taller grass. The grass is probably about, you know, waist high. Uh, you can see the two track marks that go back along the parallel with the wood line there. Okay. And uh, at that point or shortly thereafter, uh, you and other detectives began maybe searching a little bit closer into where those tire tracks went? Yeah, we began to follow them. Um, they went back uh, probably about to an area where uh, there were some, some white wooden boxes that are old beehives that are just kind of stored along the, the, the tree line. And that's before you entered the woods, correct? That's before I entered the woods. Okay, so we're going to pause there, and I'm going to have you look at a couple of exhibits first, so we're all on the same page. Exhibits 75 uh, through 81. Uh, just page through those and give me just, uh, in general, what am I looking at there? Okay. Uh, 75 is the driveway entrance uh, for the, um, the residents to the farm. Okay. You can keep going. Okay. Uh, 76 is just going up further along the driveway. You can see it starts to split at the end there. Uh, this little angle to the right here goes towards the house, and the one to, that continues straight on is the one that continues to where it becomes gravel and goes up towards the field. Um, here's where if you were to take that little fork in the driveway and go right, you would see the house. That's number 77. Number 78 is the, the back side of the house, but if you drive in uh, to the driveway, so the garage would be on the right side of this picture. So this, is, this would be facing back towards um, like the pool area. Sure. And that's number 78. 79 is the gravel driveway where the paved portion turns into gravel and then continues up towards the pool. Okay. That's 79. 80? 80 is uh, after the, the gravel driveway ends, and we're now heading the, to just the grassy area to where the, uh, you see the raspberry um, garden here and then the pool. Okay. And then 81, uh, this is the area in which um, uh, Crescent had... Uh, pointed out to me that the vehicle had parked, and she actually noted out that these tire marks here in the grass. Your Honor, I'm going to object again as hearsay. Sustained. Sure. And, okay. But is 81 that area that was pointed out? Correct. All right, I'll take those exhibits. I'll move to publish uh, 75 through 81. I think they haven't been moved into evidence yet. I'll move them into evidence. Any no objection. objection. They are received. You may publish. And if you could put the HDMI 2 on, I'm going to display these off my computer so there's no glare. Um, exhibit number 75, we're looking at the driveway coming from the street up to the house. Is that correct? That is correct. We'll just page through these. 76, that's that driveway going up right before the split. Correct. 77, coming up toward the house. Yep, that's the split to the right, um, looking at the house. 78, a view of the house. Correct. That's the lawnmower we might have heard about people driving around. Yes. And uh, if we're looking at this house, um, uh, beyond it is the pool and the shed and that grassy area, correct? Uh, if you were standing at that patio door and looking away from the house would be the pool. Okay. 79, the gravel driveway as it goes up towards the pool in that area? Correct. 80, uh, now we're, we're up kind of in that grassy area? Yep, that's where the gravel ends and it, it's just the open area. And 81, I think you described this as generally kind of the start of the area that was pointed out to you. Yeah, it's the mowed area just to the south of the uh, big shed. Sure. 
Uh, I'm going to do this a little bit differently now. I'm going to show you what's been marked in this case as exhibits number 82 through 107. Just by yourself, page through those, and the question at the end is going to be, are these photographs of essentially that area leading up uh, to what you found and the items that you found in the woods? I'm going to ask you, and then we're going to look at them all together, okay? Sounds good. So you can just look through those and let me know if that's what we're looking at. Is that 82 to 107, Council? Correct. Thank you. Detectives reviewing those photographs. The state's about to introduce into evidence. We're going to squeeze in a quick break. We'll get you right back live into the parents' dismembered trial next. Welcome back. Let's go right into the courtroom. They're reviewing those photographs you just saw the detective looking at. And now they're being shown to the jury. The fancy word is published. So, uh, picture doesn't show it as much, but there's... Uh, again, you can see the vegetation in the, in the ground there, but it was very directional as far as this area. To see like this log, um, the, the vegetation had been trampled down. So it's hard to tell from this picture, but there's actually a downward slope here. You know, if, if the trees weren't here, it'd be a good little sledding hill for little kids. But there's like a downward slope that goes down into, you can see like a little brush pile uh, down there. Okay. 88, what are we looking at there? Uh, more of the trampled grass that goes to this log uh, that goes across. Um, and then you can see they the, get the green moss on the log, but there's areas where the, the green moss had been uh, scraped off as if uh, something had scraped it off. Did you notice anything ultimately beyond that log at this point? Yeah, um, the pile of sticks on the other side of the log. and. Uh, there was just something that wasn't natural under the sticks. Did you go check it out? Yeah, I got as close as I had to. 89, the photo just moving a little bit closer. Yep, yeah, again, you see the scrapes on the log there, um, just under the moss, and then um, you can see the pile of sticks there and there's something underneath it um couldn't quite tell what it was right away so i stepped over the log and got a little bit of a closer look and what did you find i didn't know what it was at first um, what do you mean by that it just it took me a while to process what i was seeing you know it um then it was became obvious that I was looking at a human torso. Okay. So we're going to move in a little bit closer to photograph 90. And again, we're starting to maybe be able to see that, what you saw that day? Yes. Under those sticks. Okay. Going to 91, a different view of kind of looking at through those sticks. Yeah, and that, this is about the view that I had. Um, you could see um, the flesh-colored skin on the right uh, and the, the belt um, and pants and a, a black rope attached to it. And was, uh, you can see the rope coming out uh, from the bottom of the stick pile. Okay, we're going to go to the next photo, which is 92. Just a close-up of under those sticks? Yes. At this point, counsel, I will caution and remind the jurors that um, obviously at some point these photographs will become more explicit as necessary for the state's case in chief. And um, I just remind you to observe them for whatever length of time you believe is necessary as a juror to do your job. If anyone needs a pause, we'll be happy to do that. And I know Attorney Brown or 
Other counsel, if they're using any of these photos, will alert you every time the photo is going to change so that if you have diverted your gaze, you'll know to look back to see the next photo. Please continue. Thank you. Okay. We'll go to the next photo, 93. What are we looking at there? Um, that's the rope that um, was attached to the body. Is the we'll rope the in the upper right-hand corner? No, it's all throughout the picture there. I don't know if you can see it from your oh, angle, okay. but Thank you. it's all throughout the picture there. Thank you. It's we'll kind go of to coiled the up like a snake. Photo, which is 94. Now, we're briefly going to turn away, but what is that? That's a garbage can. And uh, where was that in relation to the torso? Uh, so in relation to, so this is back up closer to the top of the hill. Um, off to the right out of picture would be where the uh, uh, beehive boxes were. Okay. And that tarp was out there around the time you found the torso? Or that, mm. that, that garbage can? The garbage can was there. there was, the tarp was inside of it. Excuse me. And then, is this a close-up, exhibit number 95? Yes. Okay. Now, moving back, obviously, number 96, we're back to looking at the, that pile of sticks, correct? Correct. We're looking at the human torso underneath the uh, pile of sticks. Was it a considerable pile of, of debris on top of the torso, if you could describe it in any way you could? You know, it wasn't natural to... It, it, it looked like it had been accumulated and placed on top. Um, it, there wasn't another pile of sticks nearby. Similarly, um, it was mostly a collection of, of dead wood that was placed on top. Okay. The next photo um, is number 97. Just looking at it from a different angle. Yeah, and there you can see the belt with the rope tied around the waist. Okay. Um, so the rope was both off to the side and we... We saw, you saw it around the waist? Correct. Okay. Um, number 98, what am I looking at there? <clears throat> um, you're looking at the torso uh, with, uh, I believe that's gonna be the uh, most obvious sign would be like the right shoulder with the arm severed off, the head missing. Okay, we'll go to the next photo, which is 99. What are we looking at there? At the upper shoulders uh, of the back of the torso. I'm gonna go to the next photo, just 100. What are we looking at there? Uh, you can see the back of the torso. Um, again, you see the, the belt and the pants, the rope tied around the waist. You see the, the back hair is uh, pretty visible. Okay. Now I know we're looking at these all at once, but um, I think you mentioned earlier on, on the way out to the, to the property, knowing what you had heard, you'd already called Dr. or you'd already called Barry Ehrman, who's the director of the medical examiner's office. At some point, other people arrived during this search, right, from the medical examiner's office and things of that sort? Yes. Okay. And while we're looking at them all in one group, um, there was a removal of the debris at some points over the torso, um, kind of supervised by everyone who was out there, making sure it was done correctly. Correct. Okay. So the next photo we're going to start to see... Um, what that looked like maybe after some of the debris was removed, okay? Um, we're gonna go to photograph 101. And just describe that if you could for the record. Again, it's the, the torso we found, however, um, all the branches have been removed from the top of it. Okay. Um, was that the position it was in after all the branches were removed? Yes. Okay. And I think you testified previously that, that the the limbs and were, were severed and the head. Um, a couple different views. Of These photos uh, the jury is looking at right now are absolutely horrific, as you can imagine. We're going to squeeze in a break. We'll get you back for more testimony right after this. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Julie Grant. Thank you kindly for spending part of your Thursday with us. Just want to give you a little reminder before we head back into the parents' dismembered trial in Wisconsin. Court TV has a policy of never showing graphic photographs. And right now, the jury is looking at some of the most sickening, disgusting images you could think up. The detective detailing finding that human torso. And right now, they're looking at photos 
of the torso. Very upsetting photographs. Uh, we are going to go in live, but you're not going to see any of that. So just wanted to let you know if you're seeing the seal in the courtroom, that is why, of course, the court would not um, want the public seeing those. And of course, Court TV would not do that in, in any uh, event. Uh, so that is what is happening in this case. I believe we're going to go back into the courtroom, if I'm correct, and there is the detective on the stand. His name is Brent Baverstock. He's with the Dane County Sheriff's Department. The deterioration of the torso. Were there insects and things of that sort around? Well, typically we'll call in a forensic entomologist, um, but the yeah, it's part of the decomposition process when a uh, a any animal or any living tissue is exposed to the elements. Flies will come, they'll lay their eggs. Uh, within a certain amount of time, those eggs will hatch into maggots and the maggots will feed and uh, begin to consume um, and uh, continue on with the process of breaking down the body. Okay. Um, we're, we're coming to an end, but fair to say that, while well, you may have been the first one to come upon this, a lot of people ultimately descended on this farm and got involved in the investigation at that point. Yes. Okay. And in fact, we're probably going to hear from you again in this case, aren't we? Probably, I would think so. Okay. I have no further questions for now for the detective. Cross-examination. Nothing for now. Thank you. May the witness be excused, but not released. Yes. Thank you so much. Detective, thank you. Have a good remainder of your day. Sure. Attorney Brown? Uh, I think it would be a fair place to break uh, for lunch. I think we can do that. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a little early, but I always think that it's either... Better to be well before noon or afternoon, um, but I don't know what your plans will be. It is almost 11.20, and let's uh, plan on being back at um, about 12.45. You heard the judge there. The jury's going to be taking their break in this case, going to be heading out to lunch. A perfect time for me to be talking with our guest, who is standing by in Denver, Colorado. Criminal defense attorney Jeffrey Wolf is on the program today. Jeffrey, good to see you this afternoon. Thank you for lending us some of your time today to watch this unbelievable trial. Um, you think you've seen it all in criminal court? Just come to work tomorrow. That's what uh, one of my great uncles used to say. There was a sheriff's deputy a long time ago. And um, I want to talk to you about what this sheriff's deputy uh, was saying on the stand. We know he's a detective in Dane County, and he talked about going to that property. And as I was watching him, he was, he was, you could see the, the change in his face and, and hear the change in his voice when he was talking about what was underneath that pile of sticks. Uh, share with us your reactions to that, the way in which he conveyed it to the jury, and just being someone who practices criminal defense work, what effect you know, does investigative work like this have on an investigator like that one in Dane County? Yeah, I thought he did a really, really good job of conveying to the jury that this was not normal, that this was not part of his everyday job. Because anybody that works in the criminal justice system on either side of it, whether it's a prosecutor or a detective, investigator, or on the defense side, there are certain things you just don't see every day. And we do see a lot of things that would make most people skin crawl on a daily basis, but something you don't see every day is a dismembered body and body parts out in the open, decomposing. It's just not something you see every day. And so what a, the effect of the detective having a personal affect from that is, is that it lets the jury know the gravity of the situation, that they're seeing something unusual a little bit more in the prosecution's mind depraved here. And it, I think it conveys the severity and the seriousness of the offense to the jury to have it actually affect the detective. And I don't think he was play acting because like I said, this is not something that anybody sees regularly, much less a rural Wisconsin investigator like him. And so this is unusual. It is a little bit more graphic and gruesome than most cases would be. And I think he did a pretty good job of conveying that emotion to the jury. It's so well said, Jeffrey. I, I completely agree with you. And uh, we touched on this a little bit the other day on the show. I was saying, you know, if you've ever had an abuse of a corpse case, uh, it is something you will never forget, whether you're a prosecutor, a criminal defense attorney, investigator, or even just a member of the court staff, when you have to see that evidence and look through it and think about the Herculean effort. I mean, and it is a Herculean effort to dismember a body and then scatter the body parts around 
as is alleged in the facts of this case. Um, and then when you think about these officers who have a task of going to work and not knowing what they might encounter, it might be drafting an affidavit, interrogating a suspect, or stumbling upon a human torso. Um, you're right, he really impressed upon the jury the gravity of, of that, that scene, that crime scene. Um, tell me about the challenges you see, you know, when you have a crime scene, you know, things are, are scattered in this case. It all isn't contained to one place. It may have started at the home, but then, as we know, um, it, it extended beyond the home. And for investigators to piece that all together, um, talk to us about practically how many hours and all the manpower it takes to even do that and, and solve a case like this. Well, the, the manpower hours are almost incalculable because they're going to be different every single time, right? And that's one of the reasons that a defendant would do such a thing if he, in fact, did this, right, is you would you would want to make it harder to investigate, harder to solve, harder to piece together. But the problem is, in modern forensics, it doesn't matter. They're able to put things together much quicker than they used to be. They're able to take a small piece of evidence and get a larger picture out of it, even if they don't find the entire picture. And so it's an immense amount of work, an immense amount of work for detectives to put together something like this. And then it's an immense amount of work for the prosecutor to sort out everything they did. And an even larger piece of the puzzle is the defense team trying to make heads or tails of what they're looking at when they get this. Anytime you get a case that involves a large amount of forensics and a huge investigation, that means that there are going to be hours and hours and hours of just video of what they did if they're wearing body cams like they should be. Additionally, you're looking at thousands of pages of police reports, thousands of pages of medical records, thousands of pages of autopsy records, photographs. The amount of data that gets generated by an investigation like this is incalculable. It's impossible to know what you're gonna look at when you open that file. Well said, Jeffrey. Uh, and when this prosecution team is estimating this trial could go a couple weeks, uh, you believe it, don't you, right? Knowing the, the sheer volume of evidentiary matter they have to show this jury. Right, even with the defense not questioning almost all of the witnesses, especially extensively, they're not really questioning anybody. But there is so much for the prosecution to lay out that, yeah, this trial could go on that long with the defense not putting up much of a fight on a lot of this evidence because to them it's not what they need to be focused on. Obviously this stuff was found. Obviously it's there. None of it necessarily points to the certainty of the guilt of their client. And so they're not taking a bunch of the jury's time. But the prosecution doesn't have much of a choice. They have to get this all in front of the jury. Jeffrey, talk to us, please about what the defense is doing here. You are a criminal defense attorney. You're in and out of courtroom day in and day out, um, courtrooms day in and day out, and trying various cases. Here we're seeing a defense on innocence grounds. And um, I'm curious if you think this is the best approach for Chandler Halderson's legal team to be taking on a case like this one. So it's hard to know what the best approach is in any case just by watching the trial because there's so much that goes into it. There's meetings with the client. There's evidence that maybe isn't going to the jury. There's evidence that hasn't been presented yet. There's questions that haven't been asked yet, right? But as of right now, what we're seeing is something that you often have to do in a case with tons of witnesses is you have to be surgical about the questions you ask because the jury is waiting on bated breath for everything the defense does in response. And sometimes it can send a very, very clear signal to them to don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain if you don't ask a question of a witness because what they just said has nothing to do with whether your client committed this crime or not. They are testifying about a gruesome amount of violence depicted on a body. But if your client didn't do that, what questions do you have to ask about that body? None. Jeffrey Wolf, thank you so much for all of that. Uh, so much more we want to discuss with you here on the program today. It's getting to that time. We need to squeeze in a break, though. When we come back, we'll talk about a motions hearing, a big one that was had in the case of the doomsday couple. It took place on Wednesday. And the issue is trying to silence Lori Vallow Daybell. What? And her former attorney from speaking to the public. Why? We're going to break it all down for you next here on Court TV Live.